Hello, my name is Bugs, and this is the first of two follow-ups to my video from three years ago, Complete Narrative Analysis of the Stanley Parable. If you have not watched that video first, please go do that for obvious reasons. In December of 2021, the launch date trailer for the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe was released, not containing a release date for the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, a game that when making my first video three years ago, I was worried my release before I was done. Oh, the humanity. After the release of the trailer, interest in the game surged dramatically, something that did not happen when the other trailers were released, but nonetheless, my video warmed its way into the YouTube algorithm's hands, and it got 70% of its current standing views. Thank you everyone for 10,000 hours of watch time! Uh, the big part of that boost in popularity was getting many, many comments very quickly, many of them very long, as fitting of my very long video, many of which bring up excellent points about the game and my arguments, and I want to talk about them. I want to continue the conversation, show what I've been learning since that old video and where the current conversation of the Stanley Parable stands, so before Ultra Deluxe comes out, let's discuss some comments. Starting with... So in the original video, I personally felt generally negative and confused about this ending, claiming it lacks focus or direction. Several much more clever comments brought to my attention and honestly perfect reading for this ending, calibrating the player. As best put by commenter DYWYPI, this ending establishes caveats for the game's themes. If you think about how the player gets here, it's all about denying the narrator in a very video game way, as opposed to the free choice ending, it's about platforming off of the current path of the game by jumping off the lift. Uh, this is when the writer, via narrator, in the role of a game designer, takes this ending, the one I kept saying in the first video is many people's first path for the game, to establish some limits for what the game isn't. Minecraft is the most open game, well th there's other examples, but it was definitely symbolic of infinite possibilities in open world video games when the Stanley Parable was being developed. When the narrator, the game designer, starts toying with unlimited outcomes and complete, asterisk the usual, player freedom, he notes, Oh no 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 no, this is far more open ended than I had in mind. I'm looking for something more narrow and linear, something that makes you feel utterly irrelevant. This won't do at all, one out of five. And then you're sent to a map from Portal, a narrow linear progression game where the player is left to their own devices, which is also not something the narrator is interested in. I really don't care much to see you stumble through any more of these games, and I highly doubt you're any wiser for the experience, which is why... The narrator, the game designer, is here to tell you a story while you play the game. It won't have infinite choices, but it won't be linear. This culminates in a purposely oppressive atmosphere of the beta office, as pointed out by commenter MR Waka Waka, perhaps not phrased perfectly, so I'm adding my own parenthesis. The game is very hateful in this ending of other video games. It's as if it's him saying, look how unrewarding exploration is. The game takes an exaggerated level of angry mood in order to drive the point of what the game can and cannot promise to provide, using the path of most resistance. You can't fight the game forever. As put by Commodore Stouthelm, it's purposeful in tricking the player's understanding of the purpose of the game and also in order to play into the topic of the ending, which is exactly it. And the narrator agrees. He needs me. Someone who will wrap everything up at the end to make sense out of the chaos and the fear and the confusion. I failed to see this in my prior video. The narrator is right, the player tried to never compromise, only playing their own game, their own path, but in order to truly find value in this game of choices, sometimes Stanley needs to take a seat and enter input, play along the necessary constraints of the systems, and pretend to obey in order to play the role and see new things. Before we move on, I'd also like to discuss my complaint about missing content in this ending. This, while somewhat of an oddity, makes sense in the new context. The game isn't everything forever. While it's okay for me to complain about this game, the game isn't immune to criticism, the game also answers me with this ending. Yeah, I'm just a game. I don't have everything. Indeed, not every contingency is covered. Either play along or don't. And with that out of the way, let's play along.
Can I just share that rewatching my own video nearly three years later is one hell of an experience? Like, besides how surprisingly well it holds up, when re listening to the confusion part, I thought in my head, oh man, I should have elaborated on that concept. And then Past Books was like, you may see where I'm going with this. And I was like, oh snap, I did elaborate on that concept. And then I kind of didn't. It's a real roller coaster of emotions. Multiple commenters replied to the part I said as a joke, uh, please leave a comment if you understand the snacks part, but I'm very glad they did since there's some great insight there, almost in agreeing on this. The stance being taken is that with no Stanley to observe the office, there is no narrator. The narrator only sees via Stanley and were there to be no Stanley, there would be no narrator. Now, Stanley exists in the office, take the office, which is functionally all of reality for Stanley, take that away, and there is no narrator, since Stanley has nothing to observe. Is this office in fact the skeleton of my own relative experiential mental subjective construct? And now that hopefully everyone, mostly me, understand the claim, allow me to respond, uh, which I didn't do in the last video. I firmly disagree with the philosophy. As pointed out by Marcy Raven, this is a solipsistic approach, an approach assuming that were there no sentient beings to observe reality, there would be no reality. Reality is only there when you look, like video game render distance or backface culling. I find this philosophy in real life useless non-science nonsense that, while not harmful in a vacuum, it does not exist in a vacuum. The common extension of this philosophy into I am the only one here with a mind, the rest are just there for me to see, feels like a dangerous slope. It feels like a few logical skips away from the self-centered close-mindedness and disregard for new opinion on critique that life is throwing challenges at me and they only exist to be beaten. If I present the opposite of solipsism as knowing everyone has their own inner lives, hardships, problems, and that you have little to no relation or effect on most of them, a feeling known trivially as Sonder, you might understand why opposing solipsism feels very favorable to me for a hopefully progressive and accepting view of the world, one that I hope to employ and think is right. With that soapboxing said, this claim actually holds a lot of water diegetically, like it's literally only applicable and provable in a video game, a game like this. Yes, The Office is the skeleton of all of the narrator experiences, correct. Without the level, the player couldn't go places so the narrator wouldn't have things to comment on. There can't be narration about a choiceless journey, seems to be the claim. These conflicts and challenges must exist in order to facilitate the existence of a narrative. Stanley and the narrator must both exist somewhere inside a video game in order to experience anything, which leads into the other point of this ending. The thing I felt like I didn't go with far enough in the original video is how the narrator is deeply tied to Stanley in this ending, and as phrased by commenter DYWYPI again, the point of the confusion ending is actually that the narrator can't make meaningful choices. A conclusion I came to in the original video was one where Stanley and the narrator's knowledge is shared, the narrator as Stanley's personal angel on a shoulder type of deal. However, a new lens, a more analytically effective lens, is that the purpose of this equally limited knowledge and control of the world between Stanley and the narrator is the game setting a limit for not just the player, a la the gaming ending, telling them they have to somewhat play along, but also a limit on the narrator. The narrator isn't real. The narrator isn't an endless fountain of options either, and the narrator also needs to play along, read his script, but unlike Stanley, it's not because otherwise he would have nothing, but there is nothing for him to not play along to. He's just a collection of code and preset lines. Everything is scheduled, and a narrator under the confused impression that this isn't true is going to eventually face the truth, face the confusion ending schedule. In general, in my time across these three years, I got better at narrative analysis, and an important part of it was realizing narrative analysis isn't just logically understanding what's being said during the text, but what's meant to be taken with you. What are the post-game, the, the medium is the message-esque meaning that is being imbued into our view of the world and its many mediums through this singular work? And this self-definition, the boundary of player and boundary of narrator, are exactly that type of more meaningful narrative analysis that I want. 
messages an explicit concept that can be then transferred to other works that now that we were taught how a game explicitly defines the boundary of the narrator we can start using it as a critical tool seeing where games fail to know their own narrative boundary and suspension of disbelief the fallacy of infinite outcomes and how games make or break that immersive idea things like that are what i find most important in this grand scale reading of a game about video games this is what was missing from the ending of the last video, understanding the tools of the process, not expecting a final nail in the coffin. And with that, with a mind more tuned into finding tools and parallels, let me take another stab at the very, very divisive free choice ending. A big sticking point for the comments here was, as put by, I guess I'm committed to reading the usernames now, uh, as put by Biggest Bonavinius, my assertion that you will never find the free choice ending was a sticking point, and yeah, I definitely agree. It really isn't as impossible to fathom or attempt as I made it out to be. Continuing that comment is the note that the light swings in and out of view during that scene, revealing and holding the outlet. This is a big deal, this is classic source game art direction and it's definitely intentional here and it was a mistake dismissing it so bombastically on my part. I mean, it supported my point, but that's no excuse. But also, was that point any good? Let's review the end of the free choice ending, the controller standing above a previously player controlled, unmoving Stanley in the two doors room is eavesdropping on the narrator, begging the player to make any choice. Me. Whatever choice you make is just fine. They're both correct. You cannot be wrong here. We can work together. I'll accept whatever you do. I simply need you to take that step forward, please. Choose. In the original video, I described this moment as the game sealing away the game context as the game's message in any way. Game context being how I describe taking the game's messages diegetically as what they are as the game's message. And I think I can do better than that now. This excerpt, the game needing the player to make choices and all of them being okay, is just like the message we derived earlier from the game ending via subtext. It isn't ruling out the idea that things said by the narrator can be what the game is trying to say, since that's a shallow view to them, that's limiting, this is a massive game with so many takes and views and presentations of different aspects of the medium that saying anything rules out other readings is to be overly critical of my past self, immature. While there's merit to saying this ending presents itself as more important via a credit scroll and the thanks for playing, that indeed strengthens its importance in the eyes of the authors, this does not mean we must follow its implication down every branch of the game's narrative. The ending in this light is a comical overdrive of the gaming ending, blunter in message but comically fuzzy in dialogue. You're presented with the cold reality of a game you can't make choices in since you've been making the wrong ones prior. You're treated as a real person by the narrator, but still under all the limitations of the Stanley character, who can only walk, interact, and crouch. You can't speak into the receiver. The game is playing with the broken suspension of disbelief, mocking you for trying to make choices beyond your control, gesturing towards the idea of a game you truly impact when all you have is a controller and a preset collection of code. The game, with no word or agreement for the narrator, chucking you into both options, reloading the save of the alter two doors option is a very direct interaction from the designer. Here's both options, you wanna see all the options, here they are. This is what happens when you don't actually commit to your choices, when you try to make every single choice, and finally, here's what happens when nothing happens. And something I want to distinguish from my approach in the last video is that instead of saying what the game says, I want to see what the game asks. With the entire context of the Stanley Parable in mind, as a game about choices and games, what we are meant to take away from this ending that's explicitly showing you three different outcomes where you didn't make a choice, three extremes at once, end rolls credits, I think what we're meant to take from that is a question. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about this concentrated injection of the entire game? How do you feel about having to see all the endings? Do you feel better for beating Sans? Do you feel better for hacking into the serious room? Did you have to do it? Is it a choice or not? 
The game is one of claims, it's one of a discussion. It makes many points and casts many arrows and shadows on specific subjects, but it would be narrow-minded to consider it one with one specific takeaway. When it asks so much more of us as players, analysts, critics, it's making good questions and those questions are best answered as more questions to keep the flame of discussion alive, to never stop questioning the systems and definitions we use, to let each find their own meaning and implore you to change that meaning the more you learn and to always learn more. Uh, I think the, the question of what are games is kind of one that's very kind of fun and interesting to talk about, but um, not. I don't think a, having a definition is especially useful. My answer that is, my answer is who cares? <laughs> So, with more understanding and less limits and general comfort in the situation, I think the rest of the video can just be responding to singular comments about individual endings and lines in the original. I don't think I need to read these all out loud, I'll just keep them on screen as I answer. Bladala says, This is a nicer conclusion to draw from the museum ending, whereas I consider the death becomes meaningless, making life the same, to say that the game is claiming when outcomes are known, achieving them is pointless, while this comment's view is more about how, when the outcomes are dramatic, them being just one in a pile of possible outcomes lessens their effect. A dramatic death in one of those playable horror movies a la Until Dawn might feel lessened by the ability to play again and have it not happen entirely. There are hours of wonderful content about this direction of debate regarding Choice Matters games like Life is Strange and Telltale's library, which if anyone watching this wants to explore, I recommend Superposition, the genre of Life is Strange by Innuendo Studios as a jumping off point since it's a great discussion to look into. Big fan. And to the chestnut knight says, During the museum ending, I fleshed this list as my reasons for disagreeing with the claim of achieving known outcomes becomes pointless, and it fairly brought some confusion, being one screen tall and lacking nuance. This comment focuses on the fourth of the reasons, not, not the third like it says, but I think I just personally like to go through all of them in order, even if I am making a bit of a strawman to argue with here. First, video games are the only medium that can consistently and naturally deliver choices and the illusions of choice. Choose your own adventure books come close, interactive Netflix shows like Bandersnatch, Minecraft Story Mode, Stretch Armstrong The Breakout, sure. Uh, all of those are still video games, they might not be Call of Duty, but they are a playable video. They're video games to me. Choices are unique to this digital medium in its broad, ever-expanding manifestations and saying that because they are finite they are meaningless as choices is ridiculous to me. Second, art created by another is always limited when it's a product given to the public. If you want something you can truly impact, you will not find it in art made by others make your own art. This isn't to invalidate criticism as a whole, of course, I don't want to make the chump anti-critic well if you're so damn smart argument, this is to argue against this complaint where the choice was finite in number and designed by another. To me, that is art. That tangible thing designed by another given to you is the dialogue of art. Even an open-ended video game like Minecraft is still the result of working artists providing a space with rules. When terraforming in Minecraft, you aren't truly impacting Minecraft, you're just playing it and having fun. Where is the line between impactful and versatile choices? I draw it blurrily and do not consider it a limit. Third, all games have a bound limit by nature, as I just explained. The difference between sports and video games are that in sports you are only allowed to do what's agreed upon and in video games you can only do what's been allowed by the system and code written into the experience. You aren't allowed to pick up a soccer ball and throw it into a goal, but in a video game you simply wouldn't have that ability. Example taken from the same folding ideas video as last time. Lack of choice is core to the fact video games are finite in this manner. Fourth, and this is what that comment was about, I'm guessing they miscounted which segment it was, is a claim that to make a choice impactful it would need to have lasting irreversible consequences, which isn't entirely true as outlined by Ento's comment. 
my claim that a game cannot be replayed after a certain amount of times is the only way to make a choice irreversible doesn't factor in games with save data that persists beyond its permitted interactions. Like, you can't unmar the save file in Undertale from within the game itself. You can by editing and removing the literal true save file folder piece of data on your computer, but that's the kind of worms I went into in the previous video of is hacking a game valid intended content? I agree with this comment, it's a good improvement to my general idea there. Fifth and final, regarding fake choices, not unlike purposely killing the dog in Life is Strange, an instantly reversible action nobody actually commits to, but also a choice in the form of a quick time event that will replay if you fail, thus losing some tension. Because games are replayable, like outlined at the last point, it is somewhat of an unspoken contract between player and game that the player will still try and do well despite having the ability to replay. It's the duty of the game to be motivating enough to make the player want to try, like having death have consequences, but it's still on the player to keep that controller in hand and keep trying, and in that motivated desire is a fake choice. You want Nathan Drake to survive because you enjoy seeing Nathan Drake survive and find the outcome of failure less entertaining, even if the choice to survive is elementary. And those are the general five bullet pointy reasons to disagree with the straw man non-existent argument that choices in games can matter. Truly, I am tonight's big winner. On 1089 says, There's another comment or two like this, including this embarrassing attempt at comedy and or unprompted rude display of baseless arrogance, commenting on the fact they wish I had more to say about stuff like the broom closet ending and the whiteboard ending. And like, I get that they're a memorable part of the game for many, they're good jokes, but I really did try my best and I think they're just that, good jokes. The whiteboard ending is a very clear dev joke, like the author saying lol what if and adding it, and that's that. It's a joke about an explicit ending for the sake of an ending, which is silly and not a real ending. Same with the broom closet ending, it's humoring the idea of, well, anywhere is an ending if you just stop there, isn't it? Which like, I guess you can write that fanfiction in your brain, but that's like, not the point. You can stop reading a book at any point and maybe share that anecdote with someone and say, so that's all I know from that story, haha, but you can't then go on to criticize the abrupt ending and unresolved plot points of the book with the intended ending you didn't read. It's unfair. So like, even though weird nerds can yell at me in the comments that the broom closet ending is instructing you on how to make your own endings all they want, the reality is that the game is mocking this mindset or at least trying to convey that this isn't how endings work, there's actual finishing points to find, please get on with it. It's an option in every game but it's a worthless observation about any piece of media in an analysis. I, I can't account for these over-flexible points in my video because they are too flexible and irrelevant to most people because most just don't have those. Your experiences aren't universal. The intended endings are the ones that matter for the public conversation. Why yes, you can indeed pause the game. Allow me to account for all moments where pausing makes the dialogue awkward? Ridiculous. The cold feet ending is another good joke that's there just to cover all bases. The devs realized, oh, people do this, so they added a contingency. This is outlined in a great way in the Adam Sessler GDC 2014 interview with the devs that I showed earlier. How did you approach designing something where you really are asking the player to try to break or to try to violate what you think the game is supposed to do? How do you design levels? You, you, you look at what people are doing. Yeah, yeah it's easy. You, like, you just look at what people actually like do in games, mm -hmm. and it just emerges. This is another case like that. People expect an interaction, and it was needed there. Ultra Deluxe is hopefully not yet out at the time of this video's release, so I can still say that it's possible to expect those small areas, the ones added by necessity, to maybe be where more choices and expanded paths can be found. Please stop subscribing to my channel, and when the earth is turned into a man, I really did not need to commit to reading out the names. Gripping Dungeon, say. 
All right, so these two have the same sticking point, but in different ways. I replied to both of them in the comments to that video, but I still feel like addressing them here. Starting with the former, yeah, I reviewed the gaming ending in the sense that I went through it step by step and gave my thoughts on all of it. That is, etymologically, a repeated viewing of the ending. The latter says that if this isn't a review, how come I have segments complaining about missing content and player disappointment, things that are subjective and not objective? Both of these run into the same misunderstanding of what I meant when defining a review. This isn't a guide on whether you should or should not buy the Stanley Parable. Criticism does not a review make. My assertion that the videos are not reviews are because they are useless as a direction on whether the Stanley Parable is worth your money, and are specifically directed to people who have experienced it already and went in on the discussion of the piece as art. This is outlined in a great way in the opening to Joseph Anderson's Hollow Knight critique, in which he explains the struggle of criticizing a product that's such a good bang for its buck that reviewing it would make it unfair to focus on any flaws extensively. And I think I'm done with the main big comments I wanted to address, so now I just want to rattle off some short answers to short comments. No username really, just gotta put them on the screen and go. This is a cool thing to notice, but I don't think it's intentional. I think the fader was more likely a bit of polish added later in development, but happened to be skipped on some maps. I haven't gone back in the game just for this comment to compare, but my background footage is probably giving a good sense of this. Maybe. I did, it's a fun touch. I vaguely hinted at that with the implications of using a control to play the game bullet point during that one list since you aren't using a keyboard. Uh, the, the list that some comment just transcribed as if they wrote it and then timestamped the origin? YouTube comments are weird. So this person ran a whole ass study on their friends letting them play the game, which is truly something. I'm not getting into these myself, but I'd probably recommend reading these long comments and replying if you're curious, since this is pretty interesting. Hold on, I'm taking a hit. This one might seem like a bit of a shallow observation, like the one I just spoke fun at, but it's a really good thing to realize how wholly true it is for the entire experience. The Stanley Parable is part of the conversation about games, it's a game saying things about its peers just as we discuss them. As Davey Rita mentioned in a Press Play TV interview from Indicate 2013, I'm you impressed, sir. Specific stuff. You uh, well, I was asking you, about you, really specific right, stuff, but right. I mean, that's about as specific as you can get without being the artist who says, like, here's the answer but, to my question. I, you know, I, I prefer what you have just done, you know? And at that point, I'm just describing my game because I, I, I think that the game speaks for itself in that way. When you try to say answers about the Stanley Parable, you're just participating in the greater conversation, and vice versa. Those discussions about games are, in some raw palpable form, the content of the Stanley Parable. No. Please play the beginner's guide and learn a valuable lesson. I love comments like this that are like a reply to something, anything from a two hour video, as if this was a Twitch chat and I would just know what you're talking about. Non comments like this are my favorite type of YouTube enigmas. This was just a funny interaction I wanted here. It in the standard definition is for inanimate subject, a subjective loaded term that gets murky when you consider some people go by it, but I, I think it's fairer to consider the player of a video game to be something animate. I'm glad at least one explicitly stupid person made a comment about the pronoun section in the intro. Now I can say I had one too. The unintended strat of starting off a long video with something weird assholes will be driven away from is one I'm glad to have accidentally used. And that's pretty much it. Nice. This this was fun. Uh, hopefully it'll turn a lot of <laughs> is an hour by the time this video is nearly done and I had to do the YouTuber thing of editing. It's it's nice, it's nice finishing the script not as defeated with the oh no I didn't have a final thesis, but with a better understanding that the process of analysis itself is the tool that's valuable for future comparisons and discussion. Next up, Ultra Deluxe.